Hello everyone, today we talk about papal power intransigence and a next repression of descent between the 13th and 14th century. I plan to talk way more about papal history, in part because I see that um, still it's not really clear why I talk about this uh, according to the stats, right? Uh, these videos seemingly are not um, watched, uh, I don't understand even why. Um, just because, I don't know, every time you read Papal, uh, everything, you know, clicks there. And, you know, if, if I make a video about forests in early medieval Europe, oh my god, everybody has to watch that. So that's really not um, good news. Also because not just this channel is somewhat medieval history based, and therefore if you don't know Papal history, you know, can't even bail out entirely of any medieval thing whatsoever, even things that basically have to do with paganism uh, or anything. And secondly, because the importance of the papacy and the magnitude of its power and influence and legacy uh, is not really a matter, first of all, personal opinion, of course, but also um, really do not, doesn't matter, you know, it doesn't rest on factionalism or on some sort of uh, whatever you think about history. You know, again, in order to understand the world, you must forcefully know what papal history is, otherwise you can't fundamentally go anywhere. And this is so much concrete at some levels that, again, um, I, whenever I talk about these topics, I try to stress it, of course, in part, like now, but also it's from my side coming from, from an actual world that I meet out there. It's not just about the stats of my channel, but it's like Google on... on just search on YouTube what videos on papal history are actually made um, out there. Uh, I mean, I'm not even just pointing out the basically the mimification of um, stereotypes deriving mostly from Protestant-based kind of ideological perspectives, or you know, the, you know, which popes were the most evil, or look, the popes were powerful, and so this is a terrible thing, um, like showing the complete moral and historical disorientation of, of the average audience. But in general, uh, there is literally nothing about actual history. I mean, a political, military, and social history of the papacy, which is utterly unbelievable, right? Um, I try to make it not just because I, I'm not really an expert in public history per se, but, you know, again, if you are of any mm, expertise in medieval history, you mandatorily must learn because it's basically everywhere and the entire politics basically worked on the relation with the papacy at the time and um and i realized that this kind of popular screen or you know properly lack of uh, even a will of willingness of knowing papal history actually is uh, mirroring the, the same thing i always say that in my more uh, even rantier let's say um uh, content that is again most of history is not really understood because most of politics or war or society is not understood right that's the only thing that actually actively prevents um, the audience from 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 knowing anything in the first place right this is not again that's why it's not a matter of opinion right because again if you miss that in the picture what, what's your your chance to have any objective understanding of anything Again, understanding, for example, papal military power, given that we talk also about military history on this channel, we'll keep talking about this, is is a forced necessity. Uh, there was, uh, here, historiographically, it's interesting to observe also how that side of the story is not probably too researched for many reasons. In part, military history, as you know, is part of what, in fact, this sort of cancel culture that began a um, long time ago actually has to do with um, the, the whole thing. Military history is not studied as, you know, a, a military subject. It's studied as just a context uh, in function of mostly s socioeconomical studies most of the times. Uh, I boast myself to be Say not necessarily a good, but at least a true military story. And that is to say, even if I could have studied much more military history, I, however, studied for properly as a subject per se as the art of war, and not on 
in function of something else. Doesn't matter how intertwined this is, the conceptual difference is 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 importantly there. And um the um and in part also because of course papal studies do have probably some kind of uh, you know people have studied just just mostly study an ecclesiological dimension that doesn't quite take in consideration adequately the more concrete side of the story uh, we made videos recently about for example the 12th century uh, establishment of the of a consistent ter papal territorial dominion about which in that sense we know less we don't know too much about medieval Rome in comparison to, to other cities um, whose military for example is much better documented in a sense but um, in the 13th and in the 14th century the papacy peaks its power right basically at the beginning of the 13th century almost every uh, Western European state was a papal vassal and the enormity, the, the immensity of papal power, we should make properly a video on this aspect, of course manifested itself in an overwhelming uh, amount of money. I mean, something that easily, you know, not, not even major powers at the time really had. And this naturally equated itself to having the possibility of arming a large, in fact, large amount of troops that however were I mean, I've been studying this actually in in part in my my research um, that that shows how the papacy had an incredibly mostly this was in the at the end of the 13th and the beginning of the 14th century but how the papacy had um, an incredibly quick and somewhat innovative um, organizational capacity mounting up major military uh, invasions literally um, from could say a day to another because of the sheer amount of money that the papal legates were provided with this is important because normally when you look at uh, it's true that in the 13th or 14th century the papacy had um, um, you know the, the, the Europe in general had this enormous financial capacity right most the major monarchies were uh, subsidized by the great uh, banks. Uh, the Italian connection also with the papacy was, was definitely very important. Uh, most wars were really fueled with that money. And, and so it's easy to see in a way how, and also the, the spread of mercenarism as a consequence was, was pretty imposant. We made multiple videos about this topic. And so the capacity literally of saying, I, we put some money there, and so everybody would flock to to fight for us. Um, it was a very winning <laughs> policy, uh, and in part also strategy, literally, because these uh, capacities sometimes brought to m regional plans, right of scale. In, in the Middle Ages, you, you mostly um, appreciate the differences of mobilization of properly of political cohesion from the side of territorial powers right so countries provided with you know massive territorial extension but that actually has a few to do with the uh, size of of land or even of people occupying it has actually a very few to do with first first of all the willingness of those people to obey you but also with the sheer wealth right as a matter of fact just like today some of the largest countries in the world are not actually the the more developed the more powerful because of that um, and in uh, okay today we have nuclear weapons it's also a bit of a different thing but in practice conventional forces actually show this I don't need to make current examples um, so money really makes the world go around in, in a way um, but um, it, it's not even that of course it's the political project that lays beyond that and also the moral forces supporting that project in many ways um, we saw how mm, we, we made a video about uh, 15th century pu papal power recently that already addressed the issue of intransigence you know, if not in properly intolerance of the papacy mm, which was motivated in part this was eventually demonized because of all the the ideological reasons of the modern age of secularization etc um, 
by the 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 pretty intense ideological struggle that took place during the 13th and the 14th century the most famous being the, four, the one of the 14th we made videos for example about Ludwig of Bavaria um, William of Ockham, Marcellus of Padua, today we'll talk about Michael of Cesena uh, just anecdotally um, uh, to to stress how paradoxically from, from within the same church um, and the same Christendom, think about uh, the same Dante in a way that didn't push it that far, but other thinkers, especially Marsilius, would bring it to, 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 the, to the greatest extreme, right, to essentially denying any uh, papal temporal power uh, on a legitimate base. Um, and in that sense, however, we're looking at bit at, at the decline, the sunset of both imperial and papal power in the big mid 14th century contraction, uh, uh, where things were starting probably to, to go worse for, for everybody, right? The, during the 13th and 14th century, the papacy had been fundamentally allied with with France. Papacy had struggled, as you know, since the 11th century with with the empire. So any kind of Germanic uh, political recompaction that was fundamentally aimed at um, not even actually compacting the 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 Germanic Empire in Central Europe, but simply at invading uh, Italy and consolidating power, not just in you know the secular communities, but on on the papacy as well, brought the papacy to ferociously strike back to back in fact other powers in the form the vast of the Guelphs mostly Lombard League was subsidized by the papacy but especially the Kingdom of France because that was especially after the the beginning of the 13th century um, say the mid 13th century and the factual collapse of the uh, German national monarchy the largest power in in Europe and uh, up to the point that as you know in, in spite the, the, the Franco-Papal alliance m remained, th there could be ferocious struggles between, say, most famously, Philip IV and Boniface VIII, as they basically wanted to both substitute the emperor in their power. Um, the, the church had paved the, its own road for that with, since the time of Gregory VII with the dictatus pub and fundamentally with the claim that uh, every uh, this, uh, temporal power had to be subordinated to, to the church you know, where and where another because that was, would have been the ultimate spiritual um, judge right, on any uh, earthly action. Uh, from the side of France, it was simply, again, that they could afford it because literally they had an empire to stretch from the channel to, to Greece and there the, 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 the Valois and the Angevins were spreading, were putting their, um, their, their, their offspring on, on the thrones of many countries in Europe at that point, from Naples to Hungary, Poland, etc. So um, this was really a, a major axis that aligned itself with the papacy that um, didn't see much. They say here we can't explain the, the reasons of the Franco Papal Alliance that easily. Of course, France in general had some sort of um, anti Germanic bias uh, in, in, in the vast property of the empires just because of the neighboring, uh, because they were neighbors, right? They didn't have many ideological complaints against uh, the the empire actually the French as always they wouldn't see anybody else but themselves and and also because of course they they had kind of more profitable uh, terrains let's say to more profitable grounds to expand their power the Germans had bet everything essentially on on Italy northern Italy uh, that had revealed itself uh, too much of a hard uh, nut to crack the, the French settled essentially for southern Italy to strip it from the Swabians and the papacy already at that point was kind of freaking out but they wouldn't expand really northern Italy more than much at least there was some signaling especially from from Charles of Anjou uh, we made a video about him last autumn and we will have to, to talk about him as well that kind of made the, the same papacy repent you know they called the Germans kind of back at that point and that also brought to the rise of the Habsburgs in the process by the way that's how the the this the Swiss Habsburgs uh, uh, got Austria in the process 
But um, and so you understand even just the magnitude of the you know the international scale of these changes. But the French were mostly about the Crusade, were mostly about Jerusalem, they were mostly about Constantinople and the territories that had conquered from it and that would have you know at some point Constantinople if there hadn't been the Sicilian Vespers Constantinople would have been reconquered by by the Angevins right they were just mounting up that expedition and that's why the Sicilian Vespers happened because the Aragonese and the Byzantines decided that um, it was too dangerous at that point also simple accidents I mean had St. Louis uh, based um, his um, his expedition in Sicily rather than in Tunisia probably Egypt would have fallen it was a massive expedition. There were plenty of troops, not just French, but also Aragonese, English ones, famously enough, so much that Edward I actually went on to the Holy Land, almost almost getting assassinated by the Ismailites um, in the process. And, and so the Holy Land would have been French. Again, after all, the, the, the Crusades had been mostly like a French thing, right? Uh, the majority of, of the Crusaders in the Near East were, were French or yeah, I mean, kind of uh, the surrounding areas, uh, and the um, so this, this that were more convenient targets than others that could harass the papacy in a way. Also, the French were in this sense unhinged from imperial responsibility. They could blame the Germanic Empire for that. They would do it. Um, look at what happened during the Second Crusades, where you know both. Basically, the Germans and the French screwed up both, like in, in uh, at um, at Edessa. But the um, the French could say, ah, but you are the Holy Roman Emperor, so it's your fault because you're the the higher authority. Well, when at least they they <laughs> the only occasion which they would like to stress that. But uh, interestingly enough, there was never kind of a top debate between the French and Germans regarding their own prerogatives. I mean, the Germans would just operate from their own. In Italy, there were some intersections in the form of, yeah, think about the Battle of Bouvines, but out of Brunswick, there had a very few Germans. They, they were basically all English mercenaries in, in French at the same time, of course. Um, and they would operate on different grounds. The French mostly, I mean, first they looked at Catalonia, then they looked at, fl at Flanders, right? This kind of things. The, the papacy, in this sense, paradoxically, is is under uh, is under underappreciated also from a military point of view because again we see it's what I call the the giants complex right we see as uh, children of the Victorian age and of uh, statalism nationalism of the 19th century a map and we see oh look at how big or small the country is on a, on a medieval map that has nothing to do with actual relations of power uh, like not even today as a matter of fact but still this this need this hysterical need to reconnect everything to kind of something like looks like nation state you know perfectly fort estate or um, so uh, absolutely unqualified and and despicable mindset seems to stick dramatically so it's true that the papacy didn't have much of a territorial consistency i mean it uh, by the end of the middle ages yes it was a kind of a i mean territorially um, military was kind of a b rank power like mostly central italian uh possession with something scattered here and there as you know uh, uh, avignon in france or benevent in the the kingdom of sicily things like these um and naturally the power of the church derived f from the ecclesiastical connection with all over europe Right, that was a very complicated thing, and by the end of the Middle Ages, it also, you know, papal primacy, as you know, came to be more evidently con contested again for reasons that today we can't digress on, but we'll see on another uh, occasion. It is true ideologically that by the 13th and 14th century, the increased temporal power of the church was um, also increasingly criticized. It was a um, a necessity by a certain degree as we've seen the papacy had transformed into a monarchy and increased its power and tolerance because of the massive threat posed by the heresies that by the 12th century could have significantly split christendom western christendom especially in in you know in different chunks literally that would have been still a copy of rome because also the catars would copy identically all the all the papal institutions including um the Inquisition, etc. Um, so there was no such thing like freedom of thought by any, you know, there are no 
mo misunderstood modern heroes of free thinking in, in, in the Middle Ages, right? As the very often also anti papal propaganda later on wanted to tell you that people that were burned at the stake were, you know, those you know, martyrs of free thought. No, they were uh, very often some of the most radically oppressive and intolerant and fanatic individuals you could find, not, not very differently from how the world in general was like that. But in their case, the most extremistic ideologically, right? And it's as if, you know, today you burn the Marxists at the stake. I mean, but true Marxists, those, those who go put bombs and kill people, not the, you know, those, those you know, snowflakes of cultural Marxists. In fact, they're not Marxists at all because they, 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 they haven't studied anything about that in the first place. And they don't know anything about that in the first place. But let's say um, there was an establishment to defend. And, and so there are various interpretations about this regarding the, the longer perspective, like did the church also Aristotelian Thomism that was affirmed to, at that point like a rational, properly scientific uh, view of the world as opposed to the mystic Plat Neoplatonic one that had triumphing early in the old times would be a kind of a positive or negative thing. We'll, we'll talk about that because, uh, again, one thing is being idealistic, one thing is be real, Right, you you must have some degree of order, even when you know you can't simply entrust, you know, power to to a heroic humanity. If humanity is not heroic, right? You must keep things together, and that's the reason why. Arguably, yes, what we see as civilization is a sort of deterioration of the older ideals, but uh, ideals are ideals, uh, reality is another thing. And again, you know, there is always kind of a compromise, and a and also the church bore uh, the Church of Rome specifically bore some of that kind of militaristic heroic ethos that lived on, especially in uh, in the Latin Germanic Christendom. Also, yeah, I mean, mostly, at least in the way Catholicism, in fact, took form um, that resembles also some kind of imperial um, phase. And that's, in fact, uh, the, the point of the story. Like, if you want to find a, a very good trait of papal appreciation, that that's uh, one thing to start from, in spite of the of course, of the prerogatives that should have been merely spiritual or uh, or secular for the respective, in fact, universal powers. But that's also another thing we will have to discuss on another occasion. I'm really working on that, so I'm sorry to say I will talk. I will talk, but it, it's real. At least I hope to do it if I leave um, on, um, and uh, it's gonna be some 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 time soon. It, it, believe me, it's it's not that easy. Right, because it's always a matter of compromise in reality. Right, you can't you can't be in love with with ideals, but you also have to look at reality for what it is. If anything, to realize that uh, you are also part of that. So you're not really better than people believed at the time. As a matter of fact, it's quite the contrary um, in in many ways. Um, so the the main problem we made a video about Guelphs and Ghibellines recently. In which I explained roughly how, in fact, the imperial uh, Ghibelline uh, ideal was kind of more felt in Europe in general um, than than in fact the the Guelphism, the the Papacy. There, there was a much less, um, you know, a, a much lower conviction. Let's say that the Guelphs or the French in that in that instance would be the, the supporters. Of the church for some sacred reason, it, w it was more evidently kind of a secular modern um, necessity. Whereas the allegiance to the empire was was another thing entirely. Right? It could be hypocritical. It could be, you know, of course, um, you could f literally take up arms against the empire, not as an empire, but you know, as those who need to rule the empire, because that's again, in fact, how universal systems are really made, and that's how the same Renovatio Imperi had fundamentally been being created in, in a sense so we cannot really complain much in the perspective but it was really a more kind of universal and traditional belief about that the, the claims of the church were somewhat more uh, evidently interested and so this from from a power that in theory should have been just about spiritual things was much easier to criticize right the the, the, the question is what was the alternative right the church boosted a dramatic civilizational development, basically on every ground, theological, um, juridical, bureaucratic, economical, I mean, uh, 
properly the modern state is born in the papal curia, right, in the Angevin administration. Um, it's, uh, think about all the fact, we always say the investiture controversy in the, the reciprocal, it was always a reciprocal thing between the secular and spiritual power. Uh, Roman law from one side, canon law from one other, that they were, they were factually ruling Europe at the same time. Papas and Empire were not enemies, but they were, they were allies, right, on, on papers. Just that in practice, nobody was really allied with anybody at the time. There, were, there was always, there was a dramatic political instability. Things were easily reversed and not dramatically different from today, by the way. So the Middle Ages are always a very important um, term of comparison also for interpreting the, the current world. So uh, there was actually uh, um, some uncertainty and, and, and afterthought within the same church about what the papacy had become. I mean, the, all the instances of religious renewal and um, spiritual renewal, let's say, and reform it, it had always been taken seriously by the papacy. Nobody had really thought up to, uh, unless some mostly extremistic, fringes of uh, the same heretical currents that Rome and the Roman Church were probably not the center of the universe and uh, in terms of whatever model have, whoever should have ruled the church in a way um, the rule was was there just in, in the ecclesiastical administration the papacy was in part contested also because of the primacy uh, that he had taken and essentially above uh, uh, on, and on behalf, actually, of the uh, of the Ecumenic Council, let's say, but the Westerners were kind of fine with that. I mean, nobody had really criticized the papacy for the fact that it had turned into a monarchy. What they really criticized was mostly something more materialistic, like uh, the the enormous wealth and power that the prelates had. I mean, cardinals, bishops were r real warlords. They were people coming also as always like all the aristocracy everywhere from uh, from a, a very secular mindset so uh, it's kind of a utopistic idea how can you have a church that has to regulate the entire western christendom from a spiritual point of view if you don't have a base of power i mean who's going to do that how do you are uh, how can you actually attain that you think that everybody first of all you know let's leave aside the absolutely and satisfactory but obvious incompetence, in fact, of of Christians of the time in theological matters or in, in basic in literacy or anything like uh, the how do you manage that practically? Right. So, how, what was the alternative to the papal monarchy? Nobody really knows. Or how that even just from a civilizational and hierarchical point of view can can exist? You you do need two poles um, in in any uh, in any civilization that that need to struggle with one another in order to boost civilization further. Uh, the role of the church was, was immense from a cultural point of view in terms of spreading properly civilization all across Europe from areas that had been historically just the most advanced and you know overloaded rather than loaded in, in cultural legacy. And um, in the subtleties, in fact, of the struggle of, of, the, of the investors were, again, incredibly important for, for the statal development also of, of, of lay powers um, of the states of feudal monarchies. So um, it, it's really a non-question. Why shouldn't have the papacy existed and how could have been it possible not to exist, right? And let's say the fact that it happened, as you know, as most things, including the Gregorian reforms, uh, was not really meant to be, right? But some, but the fact that it happened still still shows the need for that presence to exist in a way. And the fact that it succeeded, it was not an accident of, of fate, um, but it went on with a clamorous success for which, you know, the, the Vatican still exists today uh, in that function. Let's say, uh, even though the world has completely collapsed from any moral standpoint, in, including, you know, by osmosis, you can argue also the, the papal what, what the papacy was meant to be in, 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 at a certain, in a certain valorious standpoint, but also as a Catholic, you can't really quite question that either. Um, and that is also, in fact, a very important aspect of the story, and which is uh, what Christian, uh, Christian culture is soaked into, that you, you must respect authority. You're, you don't owe it anything. 
but you still have to mind that risk, right? You don't have to just confess it. You have to always understand that there is somebody that out there is better than you and you have to listen to them. And if the authority maybe is not better than you, you have the right to even take up arms or whatever and to criticize and to contest. I mean, the same term of Israel is, you know, as you know, means struggling with God. So there is a deep... Um, connection with these ideas that in my opinion also built up a, a great deal of what western civilization is about properly in this at least in this mechanism in this relation between the lay and the uh, and the spirit uh, and the ecclesiastical authority which is dramatically overlooked and we have also kind of lost track by stressing mostly the 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 uh, the, the yeah the imperial myth the Ghibelline mythology which is however probably also less uh, you know more overlooked in that sense um, in any case the church had always been wary right the the Gregorian reforms had happened because the demands for reform had had to be met so um, if you look at what the church everywhere in Europe was in the early Middle Ages you realize what what the popes did was a, an actual reform of morals and customs and it wasn't at all um like you know just well you know we do it for mere i don't know we have to make money with that right the, there were some standards and quality that is also exemplified with by you know some of the greatest in fact popes and uh, that ever existed in medieval times that were people of enormous of, of megalo psyche we could, we could even say I mean, since even before that, of course, there was a, a ch church tradition. I mean, think about Gregory the Great, um, but the same Innocent the Third, even Boniface the Eighth. People keep hating because not just of those aforementioned prejudices, but also because they don't know actually the story of where that kind of name, uh, bad name, came from. In, in the simple political history of that time, what were the factions or whatever? People just simply say, "I oh, don't know." That that becomes a meme. Boniface VIII equates evil, and then everybody... George, have you ever studied uh, the Colonna political propaganda? Uh, or do you know why Dante wrote what he did? Uh, most people, of course, cannot properly answer these things satisfactorily, and they are even very easy things to learn, at least in the ABC. That that's So, uh, as you understand... Teaching history is difficult because you you may never know how how far people follow you and how and in my opinion uh, my my experience actually you know falling short of expectations has sadly become like a constant um, in in that uh, from from that side but um, I, that's why I need to remark this this aspects but in any case the the, the papacy had been receptive I mean that's we've seen it many times also how the integration of the monastic uh, say properly of the the pauperistic evangelic movements had in the roman church had been possible we made multiple videos about that it was a, a very courageous step and also a successful one the same went in parallel with thomism uh, that remained unchallenged up for centuries so um, that was a hell of a civilizational response at a universal uh, at a universal level and in a moment in which western europe that was a catholic europe was expanding in an unprecedented way in in history right as properly as a culture right you can have quick expansions of of, of rule but you know the, the explosion of of civilization that happened in, in in the western middle ages frankly is is unmatched by anything i've ever seen in relative terms in, in the other eras easily right uh, hands down now this um this aspect is surely the product of papal awareness and of an incredible uh, achievement that is not recognized sadly in our culture in our popular culture today uh, the the middle ages are meaningless uh, tradition is meaningless the papacy is meaningless christianity is meaningless morals and science are meaningless so uh, truly right because what you see is just a fake it's either a moralistic or scientific thing it's not morality nor science as a matter of fact and it's obvious that 
the same mechanism, in a sense, that brings me to criticize these attitudes is a bit the same thing that brought the papacy in the 13th and in the 14th century to become ever more intolerant to every uh, disobedience, political or religious alike, essentially comprehending in an undistinguished heretical platform all the expressions that threatened papal authority. Um, this could be seen as more intransigent because naturally the same ecclesiastical and ecclesiological principles point towards another direction. But at the same time, this is not an extreme, right? And you don't make, as we were saying before, a civilization with extremes. You actually build up this system successfully if it works, and it did work, right? If, if the papacy had been so terrible uh, and corrupt and strange and evil, it would have simply not made it like any power in history that crumbled after uh, quickly actually uh, if, if this place in it that the truth is that the medieval papacy was absolutely in the norm by any political moral um you know military standard of the time and it, it's pretty naive if not childish entirely to pretend that it should have been otherwise right um you know wh wh what is that Where's the, the power in history, even the just idealistically, just spiritually based, that didn't take some form of power and that w wasn't properly successful because of that, right? Uh, what the Roman Church did was astonishing, again, by civilizational standards. It, it's a major pillar in the, uh, the history of, of world civilization. It cannot be denied in any form, historically, politically, morally, uh, scientifically. And uh, just comparing apples to oranges in different years and times and perspective, it basically a proof just that people in the past were much more intelligent and capable than we are today, right? So um, criticism from people who can't even tell the history of the papacy uh, from, I would say, a, a school book standpoint is like saying, you know, go back to being a serf <laughs> under papal lands in the feudal world. I mean, because that's that's the place that basically you you belong. Um, uh, and uh, and so any form of why should we be tolerant? First of all, right to disobedience. Right. If once we have the the better standards and these standards are backed properly by the the majority of the system as it was at the time, because you don't win heresies that are widespread in, in an area that you can't even statically control by a minimal part. And, um, you know, eventually all these instances of reform were, were to, to fall, in a way. Uh, not much because, again, somebody could take up the sword and massacring the catters, let's say. But literally because, again, you can't control thought. In, in among tens of millions of people and you know where that are not even in fact controlled by a single authority so in many ways and especially the criticism to wealth is do, do not remember remind you of anything like uh, social envy uh, do you think that it's so strange there were communistic uh, essentially uh, traits uh, in in the radical movements most of the times that were an actually violent thing that catters were literally despising wanted to keep their world smaller were actual vegans this is an historical thing um, they they were radically they had a uh, radical moral subjectivism and uh, they 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 wouldn't be able in fact to build in turn anything consistent don't, doesn't it tell you anything? Like because even along the line of tradition and what really those um, kind of agnostic tendencies that could resemble some aspect that, however, it's not even correct to say of the older um, pagan religion, which absolutely, in fact, despise the, the same things on, on the grounds properly of, of actions, right? And consider how important actions were for the same Catholic Church, and how certain other, you know, heretical. Uh, movements later on also in the modern age were, were actually even criticizing that. Um, isn't it the same proof along the traditional standards that only the weak loses, right? So um, 
this considered still in times like the 13th century, that this was kind of the peak of universalistic ideology in the Middle Ages, exactly because it was the peak of medieval civilization. Um, doesn't mean something concrete. Uh, that's always kind of the question that you should point out, right? If you lose, is it because, is it somebody else's fault? Um, uh, because they're evil, if they're evil, shouldn't they be kind of weak? Uh, why didn't you win? Right, that you should always ask yourself, as for any word that you study properly, right? That is to say, not that, of course, you can relativize, I mean, if there, you are 1,000 against 1, you can say, well, maybe I'm the best person in the world, but other 1,000 people, I can't really um, kill them all um, if they attack me. Um, and the question is still, why would those 1,000 people actually uh, exist with that idea? I mean, not that you have to be bad, but w where were you where the world was going to, to f was falling apart for those 1,000 people to exist and you weren't actually, where were you right at that point? So that's also a question that you should ask yourself. And so not to stop even just to the single political allegiances, but looking at things a bit more from a universal perspective. And the world does ages and does de uh, degenerate and does fall apart, believe me. Um, so, in those times, we're talking properly about war and papal capacity to repress its enemies violently. Well, okay, the example of the Catters we can't tell another time yet. But in more recent times, in the 14th century, where also it was properly a peak of material power. Um, Think about the Aresiarch Dul Dulcinus um, it, that had uh, withdrawn uh, on the mountains of northern Piedmont to defend with arms his uh, political apocalyptic conceptions of uh, Joachimid derivation, right? Uh, against which the beginning of the 14th century was proclaiming a crusade. Dulcinus wasn't probably uh, you know any uh, particular threat to to the cons constitute order like northern piedmont was not really the center of the world it was still close to places like like lombardy the same visconti lordship against which we will see now that the papacy actually waged the the, the greatest uh, you know war of, of the of the time from its side and um uh, but the the existence still by times where when the let's say the, the major heretical issues should have been settled right of somebody who would f um, if anything in fact find enough rating en enough following to uh, hide up in the mountains and start in guerrilla against the local um, powers the local communes the local lordships. Um, to the point of needing a, a freaking crusade to be launched and a, and a bloody war to, to literally extirpate them, you know, was, made, uh, was necessary, right? That That's that's an important indicator of um, some forms of uh, dissent, first of all, that were evidently still unsettled. The, the Dulcinians are still a, um, let's say, um, kind of a mysterious movement in part because as most heresies, first of all, they were wiped out, so we don't know much about them, but it's not that they were to triumph, right? Anyone who take, uh, takes refuge in the mountains, we know it from Clausewitzian uh, theory and, is, and military practice on which it is the, the former is based, uh, is not really uh, much in a good strategic situation. So, of course, these were fringe movements like the the aforementioned terroristic uh fringe ones that you you can imagine um but at the same time this is exactly the point i mean it's as if the same existence of these movements uh, revealed how those who didn't really want to obey were not heroes of uh, again free thought or something they were just very often desperate people that yes lived in a pretty bad world that wasn't absolutely fair um, um uh, by any stretch of the imagination, but still, that in which they, they, they took part in, in the same way, right? What did they do after all? It's not that they were pillaging just, I don't know, just uh, like the romanticized Robin Hood style thing, oh, you know, 
we're still you know from the r the rich to to give to the poor first of all you're just a son of a bitch you should be put down immediately because the rich has earned that freaking money and even if they hadn't in that sense then you know put up a criminal case not don't don't go stealing and causing problems and ward the poor to by the way also deserve that you know don't you have somebody who knows better in in the hierarchy to, to how to use that money um in any case uh, these people were just killing indiscriminately, right? And this is the actual reality. Uh, to survive. And that's why the little scenes were to be put down. Whichever the motivating reason could be, which whatever the, the, the motives were, but we know these people weren't uh, advanced, developed, they weren't a hidden civilization that the terrible, obscurantistic church wanted to, to destroy. They were just fringe extremists. You know, where and another. Right? I'm sure there were good people among them, but still, you know, what, what was the world at the time? There were good people among the papacy that launched that crusade as well. Um, so it doesn't really count. If, if you are born in a culture and you complain about that culture, you, sh you should be aware of the fact that you still are that culture. So some, most of your problems are probably to be found in yourself first, if anything, from the, where you want to start the inquiry about that. And so you should first try to improve your own condition and doing it in kind of a civilized fashion if possible which at the time was was i give you that there were harsh times it was there were times of repression right but there were also times of repression because the system had somewhat over expanded without control and so uh, again would it win at the end of the day all the major uh, 14th century revolts were put down and there is a reason for that they weren't put down because the poor people, these poor martyrs in the history of mankind, yes, that they are so tender and peaceful and, you know, honest and uh, they don't ever harm anybody, um, you know, weren't just brought down entirely, they were just a part of them was rebelling and uh, the others were kind of agreeing to obeying, obeying to the order and were not, again, not necessarily this order was the top thing that you can imagine, but it kind of was, yes, it was better than the alternative. An alternative that did not really exist. There was not really an awareness, right? These people were Joachimites. They believed in, in prophecies of apocalypse, right? That had been properly written down uh, by this text of this Calabrese monk that um, also was kind of a hermit, has was kind of mysticism. And people began to believe that, you know, to, to count, that they could count on the base of his work when the word would have handed and things and this al already tells you what the mindset really was and the fact that the church so the people that should really that really knew um the scriptures better than anybody else and would have also a massive scientific education i mean thomism um, that that's what the, the top of the time you know why would you think they would put down this thing right it's a bit like today right today you can see that lots of things do not really work but at the same time, like, what's the alternative of tightening, tightening the belt and kind of, yeah, exercise, you know, making justice a bit, which is not um, uh, searching for equality, but literally making justice, which is a completely different thing, and hoping for the better, making a, an ever greater effort, right? Instead, you find people going in the street that, you know, put cars on fire, destroy shops, um, take uh, absolutely hysterical political positions that without without any you know concrete idea or awareness or again education or competence or whatever right do you sympathize for them I don't and if you don't either you know we, we, we agree solidly on something very important right um, the, the 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 major clash however happened against in fact real powers like serious ones for example the lombard ghibellines at the time that were headed by the rising visconti lordship of milan um, we made a video about medieval lombardy exactly in the 14th 15th century yes yeah, so it, it fits uh, last autumn we'll keep talking about the visconti we made some some video about them well these had become a hell of a power because here we are the probably in the moment of consolidation of the Italian seigneuries and essentially the so-called regional states and uh, Milan that was one of the largest cities in Europe had 
essentially managed to overcome the surrounding Lombard uh, communes. Uh, the, the Milanese bankers had um, soundly, and so most of Milanese establishment supported the uh, Visconti lordship, military, uh, dramatic military development, we're talking about military assets that were basically the same one of a major European kingdom, 30,000 men, uh, at some point 5,000, 6,000 heavy cavalry men, right, maintained basically regularly this period so again just the kingdom of france actually could man su such uh, an amount of troops uh, at a time this was a single you know it was multiple city states under one however major one that actually produced them by hiring them again uh, not differently from the papacy now we will see why also because it was some degree of emulation through money through hiring mercenaries mostly germans especially in the case of the milanese um army that were, um, in fact, traditionally Ghibelline. They had backed this. But Milan, yes, those who had fought traditionally against the Hohenstaufen, uh, the heads of the Lombard League, at this point they were actually Ghibellines, right? And the reason being that, of course, uh, Germanic power had uh, essentially shrank. Uh, the Angevins uh, in southern Italy were more dangerous, they were backed by the papacy. And, and there was, in part, as Milan as a great secular power, this, in fact, just Ghibelline traditional, in fact, secular bias that would criticize the same papacy. Uh, Milan wanted and almost succeeded to take over not just the, like, the, the western central Po Valle, essentially, but also Tuscany. And uh, that was largely, the latter being largely Guelph, right? You know, some Guelph communes had been overwhelmed. Uh, also in uh, in Lombardy, where the, the bipartition was was always there politically, um, and uh, therefore the Milanese that they became first of all imperial vikers because when Henry the Seventh of Luxembourg made his Rome fact in in um, in fact in in the peninsula, uh, the Milanese, uh, the, the Visconti and the Veronese, the La Scala were the other next major and in fact Ghibelline power. The Ghibellines had this military kind of feudalistic chivalric bias also of uh, imitation against the more popular kind of allegedly democratic based Guelph powers L taking a lot of criticism um, ha had expressed a lot of criticism towards probably not towards the church I mean these were good Christians it's just that they distrusted the papacy for obvious reasons they were a major power no, they were they were threatening some of the most important Guelph centers, I mean Genoa at some point so King Robert of Anjou of Naples literally go there almost risk his life uh, while the, the Ghibellines were mining uh, the, the buildings during the siege and almost got killed in the process in fact um, and that important was right the the Visconti would send uh, their famed German mercenaries heavy cavalry led by some of their science uh, to the to the Ghibelline powers in Tuscany namely Pisa um, and Lucca to to counter the Guelph Florentine expansionism that Florence was you know uh, not really heart and soul but it was you know uh, inoxidable uh, inoxidably Guelph and the most important Guelph center in Italy so the papacy and the Angevins would always look and say oh my god so whatever and uh, they, Florence uh, did, they, they always supported it against, because it was always against the Ghibellines, by the way, it's not that they liked each other either, but, you know, and for this reason, the Visconti also scare, uh, scored some important uh, uh, results against Guelph and armies that were largely properly paid, and this is the point. Some major defeats like Monte Catini or, or Alto Pasha famously that you know we have to make videos on, and um, the and, and so it was kind of a yeah it was proxy war if not open war in fact. The popes decided to launch a crusade literally against Milan, and with the objective of taking over the entire Pope Valley. This was a actually a feasible thing in a way I mean it was a, naturally a, a, an immense project because some of the uh, greatest moral material resources of Europe were concentrated there and so just a, a universal 
power of immense uh, size like you know uh, like 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 the papacy could afford even to pay for a war like that we're talking about i think the crusade against the visconti is so uh i think i would say 1 1 million 200,000 florins just in one year like something like that like i don't know if you have an idea how much 1 million florins really was there were cities that were bought for 60,000 I mean, war really does cost a lot. And then you wonder why the, the mid-14th century crisis even happened. I mean, these powers in Europe were fighting all the freaking time. They destroy each other all the freaking time. If, if, if politics and society do not collapse in the process, tell me what, what else does. It's possible that the Black Death was just a consequence of all the poverty malnourishment following to this rather than an external factor striking the way it did just uh, out of the blue. Um, and the papacy took uh, as uh, we could say an excuse but up to a certain point statements from uh, Milanese lords such as Galeazzo Visconti who um, this is in Latin quote dicebat quot jacere cum mulieribus non erat peccatum which means that you know uh, um, sleeping with, with women was not really I mean in general right with you know having lovers was not a, a sin and also that quote, quod abstinentia religiosorum nihil valet coram Deo, which <laughs> means that the abstinence of the clergy really means nothing in front of God. And so you understand that these statements, uh, like we're not going to comment the reason why abstinence existed, uh, why the, uh, the reforming papacy had imposed it to the clergy, etc. Here, as you see, there are also secular morals thrown in, like, you know, having lower sleeping with whatever it's not really a big deal and you understand that in general the you know here it would be interesting to make a broader anthropological consideration in Guelphs and Ghibellines and, and whether these voices were true how they were said of course these were highly also material realities right you know wealth was really there as, as you understand so also morals in a way are Lacks because of that, and uh, there is all a debate concerning this. I mean, Dante prayed that was a factually a Ghibelline praised poverty too, and uh, and uh, like decency and all these things. But renownedly, he had many lovers, or at least some, while he was married. So it, it was a word that we should understand on some different grounds. Maybe we'll make other videos on on these things. Never really talk about medieval sexuality in some kind of uh, consistent fashion but it's not really a deal you understand what the point here is that the major that leader essentially of a major gibbling power that is also close to the papal states is claiming things that you know the church the church says this is the point the church says if, if, if the church says that you, you you don't have an option right they are sin, and so they are devilish. And you're saying, well, it doesn't matter. I actually do it, you know, and making faces to doesn't work, right? Again, maybe so this man were even better Christians than many prelates. And there is no doubt about that statistically. But the question is, again, what do you want? Do you want just the the public official form to be undermined by that? You know, nobody's perfect. So it was obviously a political propaganda and slogan. There were ideas circulating, criticizing the papacy, a lot of pamphlets. Um, sadly enough, at this point also, there was a lot of traditional, uh, say, of oral tradition that we can't really track uh, among the populace, etc. So if, there are studies about this, but we don't have, at least in this video, the time to talk about them. Um, and the Pope waged a freaking war that lasted years in the 20s of the 14th century against Milan that was actually about to be taken. And interestingly enough, the army that the papacy put together to conquer Milan uh, was put together, like, not really overnight, but basically they sent a legate with some troops and lots of money, and, and in a few months, there would be, like, the standard size 30,000 men army 
uh, invading Lombardy and uh, and besieging Milan and camping just in Monza, this is a few kilometers distant from Milan, and, and for years threatening the city. The popes probably even gave the Milanese the idea, of probably and or the necessity of counting ever more on mercenaries, uh, Germans, mostly. In fact, the popes were the ones that also started kind of hiring them en masse, even though those were Germans. And very often it was the Ghibellines who started with German mercenaries because they still bore nationally some kind of more Ghibelline inclination that was uh, against the papacy. But eventually also the Guelphs would buy them because, again, it's just a job. And as you know, um, the Germans, after all, were coming t to Italy just for, for making money in one way or another. And um, and the Milanese, interestingly enough, before this war, uh, relied heavily on the mm, essentially in the, the traditional communal model. So properly, the 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 city uh, militia, right, and pretty large one, right, and some of the most advanced in terms of combined arms tactics, several multiple lines of of uh, knights, uh, uh, units uh, supported on, on the wings with, by, by very well equipped and trained uh, infantry, specialized infantry from all the countryside, from, from this sub and the, the one of the subjected cities. And they were massive. They were 30,000 as well, because it encompassed all Lombardy. As a, and they wouldn't make much use of knights. And it's paradoxical because after this war, the Visconti instead have only mercenary based armies, right? With the population that kind of was dispensed even for military service in practice, more subjected to the strengthened seigneurial power that in times of war kind of takes over, like a kind of superior, impositive authoritarian force, like the, the Visconti would become the symbol of tyranny. But the tyranny was seen in object, ob objectively as a positive thing. Uh, in political ideology at that point and that's great part of it fits in great in, in the essentially the refeudalization of Europe in the mid 14th century crisis as it happened in post Carolingian times as well with the beginning of the vassalatic beneficiary system in the same way moment of crisis an increased uh, militarization kind of loss of political freedom and um, the um, uh, and, and even more specifically what actually saved Milan against papal armies was actually the defection of some German mercenaries that switched side in from the papal army to the Milanese one uh, for reasons of pay, merely, uh, the sources say. Um, in fact, they also kind of tried to kidnap the, the Milanese lord afterwards because they... the, the at that point, those trooper, like the, those policies, had become too re overly reliant on mercenaries as well. So it was a uh, inter. Eventually, they managed to regulate them. So actually, the myth of the soldiers of 14, 14th century is being overly emphasized. Actually, the riskiest moment was at the beginning, where there weren't means to manage them. But for the rest, the, what happened later was more like an Italian creation than somebody really coming from the outside to to make trouble and basically not achieving anything. It's not they conquered anything or they established their own lordship. No, they were eventually expelled uh, from everywhere without uh, having accomplished anything even in the meanwhile in terms, of, I don't know, of a conquest, for example. So that's very interesting as well. This also rarely happens in, in medieval history. Um, and And so showing there a military model that essentially what would become the, one of the largest pow military powers in Europe, like Milan, had mutuated from the papal armies. And uh, this is fascinating because, again, Milan had a territoriality to defend, mostly Lombardy. The papacy didn't really. Like, there, there were wars fought in the papal states, but really nobody really invaded it, if not the emperors at some point. Um, the, there were quite troubled lands that were fragmenting again. We've made a video about the Papal States also in autumn and explained this. But let's say it's not that Milan bordered the Papal States at that point. Simply, they sent that legate in Piacenza. They established a uh, military base there and the army was formed, it was launched. So an army created out of nothing, not of the local levies. 
but naturally of allies in part of the same levies of, of the allies, of course, that were there, other city-states that opposed Milanese expansionism. But um, uh, still, like, the popes could snap with the money that always brought with them, because powers, great armies were always accompanied by the treasury to keep also the discipline of that, because everybody was attracted by the pay. And that's it. And by the way, the popes made a hell of a money there. It, it says that, in fact, in the same papal army was plenty of prostitutes, and there was a tax on the prostitutes, and the legate made a freaking lot of money. And the legate, in, in all this, wanted really to win, not just because it was in papal service. This is Bertrand de Puget. These were mostly uh, Provencal commanders in the papal army at the time, also because this is the face of the Avignon papacy that had already began, etc. Um, who was one of the few people at the time who kind of lived, died peacefully, because eventually, all, uh, after all this, he created a base, he failed in Lombardy, but he established a base in Bologna, it said, was kicked out of there as well, he came back to Provence, however, he died normally, but he, he would have liked factually also to establish a private lordship in Lombardy, like creating a regional state under papal control through the legates, and this guy also, at, at some point, th this was also... Um, these were the times in which even the differences between Guelphs and Ghibellins were blurring because of the contraction of the same universal powers. Bertrand would be a uh, friend with, for example, Charles IV of, Bo of Bohemia, that had descended to Italy and that in theory was representing the empire, but kind of ended up siding with the papacy because there were other Italian lordships that were still competing against them. And so uh, a pretty messed up situation that, however, uh, shows in a sense the how couldn't powers take advantage of the situations? If you were the papacy, why shouldn't you have had really the opportunity of expanding your own power? But in that case, however, it's worth noticing that the experiment failed, that still there was a secular power in Northern Italy that said, no, we are not going to let the papacy establish essentially a, a, an Italic kingdom uh, under papal control. We will still maintain our own lordships, etc., uh, still within the Holy Roman Empire authority, namely, right, uh, at least the, the Milanese wouldn't have problems to buy the feudal titles from the quite money-hungry and chronically short of, of, of money, you know, Habsburgs or Luxembourgs. So, again, uh, including the expeditions, the famously enough Ludwig of Bavaria's uh, Ludwig of Wittelsbach expedition in Italy was subsidized entirely by the Italians. Um, he came like with just, if I'm not wrong, 800 knights on their own. Right? And there were armies of, again of tens of thousands on, on a regular basis or a single power. Um, there, uh, equally as, and especially Charles the Fourth. Charles the Fourth was entirely paid. Like he arrived with even less men, like something ridiculous, like 400 knights just to take the scenery of a, of a city that, that called him to, because he felt threatened by, by the, the La Scala in that instance. And then he managed to create some sort of fairy tale um, feudal scenery in, in the Po Valley, but it, uh, it finished as quickly as it started, right? You know, and that, 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 those are interesting times. Hopefully we'll talk about them uh, as well soon more in detail. Um, and naturally, all this uh, political modus operandi, let's say, was backed by an ideology, right? In, in order to understand how the confusion of the temporal and spiritual plan did not depend but, but by contingent reasons, but it was at that point structural because it was systemic, right? All uh, the clergy had some power, and uh, how could you avoid that? And at this point, the church had simply consolidated on its own, because it had always remained under attack by the emperors, by, by the French kings. So, ideologically speaking, they had to boost that idea that, the, as Boniface the Head said, uh, that he was the empire, as the pope, right? Um, and so, we can see this double level looking, for example, at the same men that were used for a, only apparently heterogeneous ends, such as, for example, the minor friar uh, Bertrand de la Tour, 
uh, and the uh, preacher Bernard Gruy, right, that were um, both uh, very zealous inquisitors, that were essentially the two friars entrusted in 1317 with the important diplomatic mission in Italy uh, to, in fact, um, check the, the possibility of a political pacification of Lombardy under papal hegemony. This is only three years before the war against the Visconti would break out. And you understand if that was the aim of the mission, why it did. So the confusion of the plans of action um, appeared, however, intolerable to those who were committed at the beginning of the 14th century in the clash for the depolitization of the ecclesiastical structures. And this was also very politically interested at the same time. It was a utopia, anyhow. It was uh, a form, again, of criticism that started from theological basis, because these were mostly all canon lawyers of some sort, um, that uh, began probably to see an opportunity in the... Uh, I mean, they, they had probably some moral scruple, but naturally they knew that if they had abandoned the church, um, just the papacy, and they would have found some protectors. Think about, in fact, the former uh, general of of the uh, order of the minories, Michael of Cesena, that sided together with other eminent uh, brothers with the emperor Ludwig the Bavarian, who, by the way, entered in arms in Rome, uh, so not really making uh, a great uh, effort to be liked by the Papacy. In fact, it was excommunicated by John the Twenty Second. that was the Pope that arguably spe had spent uh, the largest amount of money for war, right? Yeah, an enormity. We're talking again a mil about millions of florins. Um, the church had a, a very imposant army, as we were saying before, everywhere, operating with, with legates, operating really everywhere. They were operating, in fact, as we've seen in the Pope Valley, they were operating in the marches, uh, there were forces in Avignon, there were forces in Rome, um, and just they were just any other power. It was an aggregational character of these forces as well. The Angevins from Naples would uh, regularly send troops as soon as Ludwig the Bavarian left Rome, the Angevins entered the city. So, like, we are in, in the presence of uh, just a politics of force. Like, if you study in detail those years, those events, you realize that uh, they weren't even trying anymore to, to put any kind of excuse Right, it, it it was a very politically ideologically uh, ideologized and polarized uh, moment, a bit like today, right? You know, look at the political sides today. They, are they even setting the, you know, the basis for a legitimization of their ideas? No, they don't. They just hate each other, and they just basically hit each other uh, lowly, constantly, because that's just what you do, right? And so, in a moment of decrease of both imperial and uh, and papal power uh, in fact the wars of at the time of John the 22nd and Ludwig the Bavarian would be the last kind of last ones in which the, both the empire and the papacy really had this even this big deal of a struggle against each other uh, I mean later on it continued in a sense but in, in terms properly of armies Right, sent to even just to make their own fight from Germany into Italy. You know, there, there wasn't anything later on. You see, you can't see properly there the contraction even of of forces. That these lines were exhausted. Right, and there there is a sort of coldening there of of the cake that remains, kind of more crystallized ever more towards this feudal ancien regime kind of, in fact, humanistic towards Renaissance um, system that we know even up to the French Revolution and it's all it's almost um, you see historiographically this phase it's been depicted as a dark one right nobody really studied this period it was it also uh, contemporary art didn't help I mean this was the, the the century of the plague of war 
showing the corpses, the, the dance macabre, and, and etc. And so that's the idea we've gotten from it. But at the same time, it was also a great moment of political regulation, military development, one side, or properly rationalization. All moments of crisis bring to that, in a way. Right? This is, again, the great medieval civilization that is dying, However, not going under like had happened to antiquity, but actually transitioning to something else, like in fact what we celebrate, like the Renaissance, the modern age, with all the due distinctions regarding the, for example, the, you know, the liberty in relative terms and things like that, that again are incidentally very much connected to anti papal ideology because. Uh, let's be honest, half of Europe with pr with the Protestant reform began to, to narrate the history of Catholic Europe and vice versa, by the way, in in ways that, uh, you, you see, these this areas wouldn't quite communicate anymore against each other, but for reasons that are l much less obvious than they seem, really, that there were some ideological preconceptions that we're actually quite dumb in a way. I mean, the same reformation, the same schism. I, at some point, it, first of all, it could be recomposed easily, right? Both Protestants and Catholics were terrible at that um, since the very beginning. Um, it, it was a known thing in many ways, but it did express a malaise and um, unsettled and, uh, um, let's say, a debate among deaf people, right? That, that's pretty much it. And... Um, this um, brought to further disaster and a further secularization and modernization and driving away from from tradition. I made a video that is titled uh, "The Rise of, Un of uh, National uh, Yeah National Identities and the, the Crisis of Universalism." That is exactly from this centuries that Ludwig of Bavaria, by sheltering William of Ockham and and Marcellus of Padua definitely contributed a lot ideologically to that. Um, there, there were ideas that had never, even a generation before, it would have never been conceivable because universalism seemed to be still the, the only possible model, role model. I mean, think about the divide that stands in, in mindset between, in fact, Dante and Marcellus of Padua. We made a video about this last uh, autumn, right? They lived a few few decades in difference between one another, and essentially they they thought com two completely different things. And yet again, and this is the thing that impresses me the most, because I can't help but seeing social envy in that, is that from the let's say the reasons to overthrow the arguments uh, on which, from more than two centuries, the pontifical hi uh, hi hierarchy was was based stemmed from the pauperistic uh, mm, polemic that is to say the papacy was not criticized because of you know what it was actually doing in practice which was was evident they were just secular rulers and, and this shows, again, how much more habituated to that reality these people really were, even those who countered the papacy. They were just saying that the, they, they wanted to get to the root of it in a sort of shortcut without explaining, in a kind of a legalistic, or I don't even know what exactly, base. That is to say that the Pope, exactly because it's his victory of Christ on earth, could not exercise any temporal power, right? Which is also kind of a debatable um, idea of uh, interpretation of, of of the New Testament in the first place, um, and even more of the old one. But let's say properly, what would have again would have what would have been the alternative? This, as much as today seems like a, an age of iconoclasm. An age of people that are so fed up by the actual problems that do exist in the world that, however, could be solved essentially through the same 
system that we have created in the past time, in the past centuries, but that people seem to simply give up on. Say, I don't care. I don't want to fatigue anymore. Right? This is why, in fact, uh, power was being handed over. Today, like, like at the time, in a refuelization of the system, so that uh, let's destroy everything instead of fixing actually the pretty damn good stuff that we already have, right? So it was just like at the time. And it sh again, the, the popes were terribly intransigent and intolerant, but at the same time, what were the others really doing at, at the same time, right? So it's a perspective that it, it was both of them. It's not that the papacy stemmed from a um, from a reality that you know didn't uh, wasn't as we've seen exactly the same one of the other side. This was just the clergy in a world in a in a lay world, right? There, there were um, political institutions. Where, where there was a constant cooperation uh, between the two in every field and that's also why you could have this kind of switch side switching because everything was so intertwined think about the development of universities the studies of Roman law and canon law at the same time the uh, a culture that is becoming truly ever more homogeneously European in many ways and this is also the birth of humanism the rediscovery of the classics of unimproved Latin uh, this is not just an era like another right so um, again, never underestimate the parallelisms that you can draw um, in, uh, you know, between this age and our own, because they are dramatically similar, dramatically, and there's nothing to be happy of. Because frankly, it, it's a it's pretty bad news if you consider what happened later because they they would have they weren't really happy times ahead it's true that also the ones before had never really been static etc there was a made a video recently on whether you know does really the development civilization means not just the uh, uh, less military potential which is not the case definitely but also less fought war well it's a hell of a debate because Probably yes. When you things are kind of better, you you have and there is enough resources for everybody. You, there is growth. You don't really need to to take from others to compete with others at that point. But this may bring to a collapse of some other level. That when things are you know going war bad again, they are you know you you may not be ex exactly equipped for for coping with again in a in a violent reality and so also causing more damage than than um you know the, than than if you had been more kind of militarily um habituated let's put it in this way um or just politically habituated in a competitive sense uh, at least so this is kind of an idea of what you, you could learn about this period. And again, I try to to draw a bit the, the sap of, of, of it all, but there is always a very solid and consistent background we're talking about here that again is political, military and social at the same time. That is also incidentally one of the phases that you never hear about in popular culture. In popular culture, does anybody tell you what happened uh, in these years, in these places, actually in a, an evidential fashion? No, you don't hear it. It's as if this thing had been cancelled. It was one of the single, if anything, by the size of things that happened, the, the events, the, the again, the battles, the uh, just, in fact, the major indicators you would have in a civilizational activity. Some of the most important easily, hands down, one of the most important periods in Western history, and yet there is nothing of that. Uh, and it's sad, and it shouldn't be like this. Uh, I will hopefully keep going in detail, but also because, telling the truth, as you know, the especially the end of the 13th and the first half of the 14th century are my field, <laughs> like, at least temporarily. And I um, I care very much for telling that part of history well because it's renowningly even among medi medievalists 
it's renowningly, in fact, uh, uh, remembered for being a total mess. And the reason being there that uh, it is a mess, but let's say it's much less, um, if, if you make the effort of studying it for some years, you, you will actually understand it. I'm maybe one of the few people who, who dare do, uh, doing it, also because I study exactly that evidential side of the story that for some reason uh, people have completely bailed out from because, surprise spoiler, it's more difficult to do, right? Not because evidential history shouldn't be known, just an idiot would think like that. Um, and nor those who were criticizing the financial history were saying that they didn't have to start it, but just that they had to integrate it with a more kind of systematic interpretation. But again, also our academic faith and consequently our um, popular consequences bring us to a moment of great, properly of collapse of whatever uh, we, we, we hope we could achieve instead. And so... I will try to invest in that uh, area that is not uh, studied by anybody else because it's, in my opinion, it's just intuitively, it's most interesting. I mean, the, the more complex, the more difficult, the better it is to learn it. You become more, simply more skilled and capable in, uh, you know, in understanding it. Anyhow, for today, I stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I uh, wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.